Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us in this Facebook premiere event covering alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, also sometimes known as genetic COPD. My name is Mike Hess, and I'm a respiratory therapist with the COPD Foundation. I'm joined today by another respiratory therapist from the COPD Foundation, Christina Hunt, and a primary care physician by the name of Dr. Brian A. Smith with extensive experience uh, in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, Dr. Smith, Christina, welcome. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Mike. So, Dr. Smith, I'd like to start with you a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience uh, with Alpha One? Um, when I started my practice about 15 years ago, um, we I actually had not learned much about Alpha One during medical school. I started uh, learning about it more and then uh, doing some, you know, appropriate testing. Um, and then that kind of just grew as part of my practice. It made sense. Um, and so we just, um, you know, started testing everybody with uh, COPD. And Thank you. And Christina, as a respiratory therapist, uh, how have you encountered Alpha-1? Well, I had the opportunity to work with um, Alpha-1 patients and really all kinds of diagnosis in pulmonary rehab. Um, I did that for about 10 years and I really enjoyed it and really found a home there because I could really connect with the patients instead of, instead of just stopping by a bedside for 15, 20 minutes. I was able to see them, you know, multiple times a week. Um, and so it really gave me an opportunity to get to know them well. Great. Well, thank you again, both for joining us today. Uh, we're going to go jump right into our topics here. And Dr. Smith, we're going to start with you. Uh, can you kind of walk us through a little bit more of the process of the screening and diagnostics uh, for genetic COPD, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? How does that work? Since we draw blood in my office, um, it's usually we're drawing blood for something else. So we uh, will just go ahead and add an alpha-1 test to that. And uh, what they do is then they'll open up the uh, the test tube that has the blood in it, and then they'll do some drops on a little card, and they'll send that into one of the Alpha-1 testing locations. Um, you can also do a, a mouth swab um, because Alpha-1 is a genetic disease, and so uh, it what we basically we just need is some cells to look at the DNA. Basically, um, once you once you've drawn the blood and they're testing that, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what you might see on the on the lab draw? So the results will come back either with um, one normal allele and one abnormal allele or two normal alleles or two abnormal alleles. Um, and then the uh, homozygos with the abnormal alleles, they'll need some further testing. And you know that's typically where you might refer that on to a pulmonologist. So with alpha-1 antitrypsin being a genetic disease, do you have any advice for doing additional screening with family history or having those discussions with family members so that you can make sure everybody is getting access to the correct therapies? Yes. So, you know, being in a family practice, we have multi-generational uh, families in our group. And so um, we'll even test uh, grandparents that have COPD who, you know, we're not necessarily going to treat with the alpha one specific therapies, but, you know, it's a great way to case find. And that's how we found several of our first uh, clusters was we tested a grandparent with a diagnosis. And then, you know, that leads to about eight or 10 people in our practice that are then at risk. Um, and so then testing those folks um, and will allow you to find uh, several people. It's, um, it's kind of an interesting uh, practice because you, you'll you go for a month or two and just have negative test after negative test, which is good um, because it is a somewhat rare disease, but then you'll find one patient and then because since it's a genetic disease, you find that one patient and all of a sudden you'll have 10 positive tests in a month um, because uh, you, know, you get all those people that are related to that patient in um, and they'll have to have you know, some kind of uh, component of uh, abnormal alleles. Do you have any other suggestions for practices who might be looking to initiate their own screening and testing program? You know, just because somebody smokes four packs a day uh, doesn't mean that their COPD is from the smoking. And so you have to kind of not look at their smoking history also uh, when you're testing this because there's something else going on that contributes to this lung destruction and COPD besides smoking that we need to think about. The important thing is just to get out there and start doing it. I think that's important. I think just testing everybody we've talked about doesn't matter whether you're smoking or not. 
important not to overlook those folks who may have, uh, perhaps we could call it hidden alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency that might be masked by uh, smoking or, or other causes. Can you go over some of the treatment options that are available for somebody diagnosed with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? Specifically, it's primarily used for uh, homozygous um, abnormal allele patients with low levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin um, there's a, a serum uh, IV therapy that uh, is available from a few companies. Um, and basically what it is, is uh, plasma donation. Then they s spin the plasma down, separate it out, get the alpha one out, uh, purify it, obviously test it for any, you know, infectious diseases and then compile, you know, several hundred donors into an, inf an infusion and then that is a weekly IV treatment uh, that patients will get uh, typically for the rest of their lives or until they get a lung transplant. Um, alpha-1 is not made in the lungs, though. So even if you get a lung transplant, you're still at risk for developing symptoms of genetic COPD later in life. So some people, even after a lung transplant for alpha-1, will continue um, treatment with these IV therapeutics. And then would somebody with alpha-1 also uh, be using standard COPD therapies as well? Yes, certainly. That is the mainstay of therapy would be their um, inhalers, um, oxygen if they need it, uh, nebulized treatments. Um, the augmentation therapy with the uh, IV infusions is, um, is on top of our standard of, standard of care therapies. Great. So once somebody gets that diagnosis, um, how do you help them cope with that unexpected change in health status? Right, um, probably several things. Uh, one is uh, it, it's a great impetus to get somebody to quit smoking. Um, you know, we've looked at uh, people who test positive for alpha one and then their quit success rate after they are informed of that, uh, their test results and it's higher than a significantly higher than the general population quit rate. Um, and then, you know, two is making sure that they're staying on top of their uh, inhalers. Um, and so limiting their exacerbations. Um, and then another one is um, following up on their um, vaccinations, especially their respiratory vaccinations. And as we mentioned before, um, it, the alpha one can affect the liver too. So we wanna make sure they're getting their hep A and hep B vaccines in addition to pneumonia, flu, um, and COVID, of course, and whatever else is down the pipeline for lung diseases. And so, Christina, I'll, I'll throw a similar question out to you. In your role as a pulmonary rehab therapist, um, surely you provided a lot of the education and, and training that people need to, to cope with this. So what were some of the strategies that you used uh, to help your Alpha-1 population? Well, I really focused on four areas. Um, the first one being education uh, on the diagnosis uh, so that they could kind of recognize what symptoms were associated with the diagnosis. Um, they could recognize why, why they may have had the diagnosis. Um, so the first piece was education. Um, the second one was just kind of knowing some treatment options for them and, you know, what might help them cope with some of the symptoms they're feeling. Um, and so we went over some of that. Um, and, you know, things of uh, breathing techniques what, to help with shortness of breath and, you know, techniques for clearing the airways when they needed it. Um, the other thing that um, we tried to focus on was like the mental health aspect and really trying to provide support um, to the patient in that way. Um, sometimes they were able to recognize that they had family members that had the diagnosis beforehand, but sometimes they had never met anybody with alpha one before. Um, you know, I can remember a time where um, I met a young mom and in the midst of trying to raise um, several young children, she got the diagnosis and it was very overwhelming, very emotional for her. Um, so to be able to be kind of a sounding board, to listen, to try to get her access to resources that she might need, whether it be somebody just to talk to um, or, you know, somebody to help her manage her symptoms a little bit better. Um, you know, we were able to really try to connect her in that way so that, that you know, dealing with the diagnosis and managing that diagnosis wasn't so overwhelming to her. Um, and the last thing was, you know, connecting our patients to support groups. I think it's very important um, for 
patients or people that had chronic lung conditions, of, you know, of all, all different conditions to really have people they can connect with um, when it comes to managing their conditions. And so support groups are great, um, whether it be an online support group or a local um, lung support group. Um, it's great to be able to be with people that recognize um, that no two days are the same and, you know, can recognize um, that they're dealing with the same kind of symptoms that you're dealing with. All right, great. So Christina, we touched a little bit on your experience providing education to people with a genetic COPD. Um, can you tell us a little bit more specific what some of the areas that you'd like to discuss uh, to help them prepare to live their best lives with this new diagnosis? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we would focus on, one of the areas of education we would focus on was lifestyle changes um, and just you know, giving each person um, some tips on wellness, uh, eating right, um, foods to avoid, um, and and exercise, uh, how often they should exercise, some things to look out for when they're exercising, you know, how far to push themselves when they're exercising is many of folks that get um, a chronic condition or a diagnosis of a chronic lung condition, they really want to go full throttle into trying to make sure they're doing all the right things. And we definitely can respect that, um, but we definitely want them to kind of uh, proceed with caution and take things slowly in the beginning, especially if they haven't been active um, and then slowly progress their exercise. So we would really focus on those lifestyle changes. The other thing um, that we would educate each patient on is things to look out for when they're having an exacerbation or a flare up. Um, so if, you know, if they're producing more mucus than they have or they're feeling more short of breath or if they're feeling a fever, uh, which is uncommon, you know, when you're feeling good, you shouldn't have a fever. Um, so any changes that weren't their norm, um, we try to educate them on, on looking for those things and then knowing that steps calling their healthcare uh, provider um, and letting them know that they are experiencing these changes um, and, and not worrying too much or panicking too much, but just, you know, proceeding with next steps. Um, the other thing that we would go over, uh, you know, making sure that they attend all their doctor's appointments, all their well visits um, and getting all their vaccines. Um, and, you know, we, we stress that, you know, that, that they needed to try to stay as well as possible, um, avoiding people when they're ill, wearing a mask in crowded spaces. Great. And Dr. Smith, anything else to throw in there from the primary care perspective, uh, especially for somebody who might not have access to a pulmonary rehabilitation program? Yes. Um, you know, I think uh, it's it's critical for primary care doctors, you know, to just get in there and don't be afraid to test and then, um, you know, and follow in these patients closely, um, you know, every six months to do repeat spirometry or um, if you don't have spirometry, just to kind of see how they're doing and just make sure they're not exacerbating, um, seeing how, you know, making sure they're staying on top of their refills on their medications, um, you know, keeping a, you know, a closer eye on these on the on the alpha one folks, especially if you find some homozygous um, alpha ones, keeping you know following them very closely, like you would you know a diabetic patient who you see every three months, um, that type of thing. Great. Well, Dr. Brian Smith, respiratory therapist, Christina Hunt, thank you very much for sharing your experience and your expertise with us today, uh, and um, I'm sure we'll see a lot of people get a lot of benefit from this program. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for this fascinating discussion about genetic COPD, also known as alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. I invite everybody who wants to know a little bit more about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency to come visit the COPD Foundation website at copdfoundation.org and to check out our genetic COPD 101 entry in our 101 library at copdf.co slash 101 library. Thanks again, and have a great afternoon.